All right, is it top of the hour? Shall we begin promptly as any clock session should? Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Inflection's ticker webinar. We'll be talking about our atomic clock product today with the fabulous Judith Olson, who is our head of clocks. Uh, before we really get rolling, I want to address one housekeeping item. We are going to have a Q&A session at the end. And so we have the Q&A box open. If you would like to submit your questions there, please do. If you submit your name, we will take you off mute and give you the opportunity to ask your question during the Q&A session. If you do not want to have to offer your question live, just tick the anonymous box and we will have our lovely team member, Brittany, read the question for you during the Q&A session. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Judith, I'm so excited to be here with you today to talk about clocks. <laughs> so before we get into ticker itself, let's do a little scene setting, a little background. Why don't you yeah. tell us more about yourself and sort of what you do at Inflection? Yeah, so I, I've been at Inflection almost four years now. Um, this came after I, I completed my PhD over at Jilla, NIST. Um, I've been building atomic clocks for well over a decade now in AMO, atomic molecular optical systems, um, akin to clocks for at least 15 years. So there's, I, I think they're just like the coolest thing. Um, so I've been studying them for a really long time. After my PhD work, I did a postdoc at Jilla with the Timescale Group for a while before coming over here on Flexions with the clocks group. Um, and since coming here, you know, we've we've landed quite a few different government programs, which has allowed us to spin out into the, the ticker product that we're really talking about today. Um, inflection has a background. Inflection was founded back in 2007, um, back in the day known as Cold Quanta. Uh, it's expanded a lot since then. We're over 230 people, I think, now um, with offices across the country and across the globe. So today we're presenting from our Louisville. Uh, Colorado office. Uh, the old headquarters are just a little bit up the road in Boulder. We also have a Chicago office, our Wisconsin Madison office, Madison, Wisconsin office um, in Austin, Texas, and uh, global offices in Oxford, the UK, and uh, Melbourne, Australia. So Inflection has, has steadily become a more global company since I, I joined. It's been really good to see everything grow and, and how we've really kind of become this new quantum um, supplier, kind of the, the premier quantum systems company is what we're really trying to do here. We're, we're not just making uh, laboratory type systems like Cold Quanta kind of did at first. We're now making real like fieldable, manufacturable, portable quantum systems that can pull out. Awesome. And actually, could you walk us through what we have sitting here on the table? Is, yeah. Is... So this is Ticker. Um, in the webinar, you've probably seen the, the picture of the, the cartoon rendering of our first Ticker box. That's you know, more than a year old now. Um, but we've actually, you know, built a few of these units. We're taking them out in the field. We're doing tests. Um, this is an awesome picture of, of Robbie over at OCP Tab earlier this year. We've also done some field demos with the units. Um, and we're, we're starting to put them into these the, the nice 3U chassis that you see here. Fantastic. And could you elaborate a little bit more on what your role is at Inflection? Yeah. So uh, originally I was leading the, the clocks group, um, started off as a group leader as we developed more and more different types of clocks and had a better idea of what products we wanted. I uh, eventually became the portfolio technology lead. And then last month I switched over to become the product manager for our clocks line to really make sure that these end up being, you know, widely manufactured and saleable products, um, a real thing you can take out of the lab and use instead of kind of a one-off, a onesie, twosie that a lot of uh, quantum companies and, and high edge tech are kind of doing these days. Awesome. Well, I think that was some really great sort of scene setting in terms of who you are, your background and what inflection does. So let's dive in now into what is Ticker. So Ticker is an optical atomic clock. Um, there's a handful of different optical atomic clocks that are, are kind of all coming to the market around the same time. Um, this is our version of it that really allows us to leverage the entire ecosystem of quantum products that we're developing here in Inflection. So when we're developing, uh, you know, a laser system for this ticker optical clock, it doesn't just apply to the optical clock. It applies to some of our other tech, uh, which at Inflection includes, you know, quantum RF sensing, um, in particular, the receive side of that is really, really powerful with some of our tools. We also have um, inertial sensors based on atoms, uh, all sorts of different quantum computing modalities, quantum matter machines to allow remote emulation of, of different types of modalities of interferometry or other things like that. So anything using atoms and, and lasers really is something we do well. Um, and that really allows us to push ticker out 
as kind of this, this first product that we're having reach market um, that will allow us to mature a lot of the subsystems that mm -hmm. are key to our other quantum technologies. Gotcha. So Tigger is sort of a, a pathfinding product, if you will. Sort of, yes. Um, it's it's a lot more than that, too, though. We, we think that there's a large number of people who would be interested in the kind of clock performance you can get from a picker. Mm -hmm. um, and in particular, it's you know the performance here is nothing absolutely revolutionary. Optical clocks can do much, much better than we're doing right now at Tigger Prime. But this really kind of fits the sweet spot, we think, of where people are looking for improved performance, also improved regularization, and then a, a smaller form factor for it overall. So this, this unit has performance about akin to a, a maser. Um, if you're familiar with active or passive hydrogen masers, it's it's right somewhere in between a passive and an active. Um, and we think that this being in the same form factors as a cesium beam type system um, has a lot of potential applications out there, in addition to a, a nice price point. Awesome. So yeah, what are these sort of product line plans? What's the vision? Yeah. So Ticker Prime, this is the one that uh, we're manufacturing now. Uh, this is the one that uh, will have the you know, official big product release coming soon for it. Um, and this is really designed for more benign environments. Our goal here is just to start getting this product into people's hands to see how they want to use it. And a lot of the early users we think will actually be related to data centers, communications, optical signal processing, um, autonomy, things like that, where you don't necessarily need to have this going in a helicopter or you know, in a backpack with someone jumping out of an airplane. So we think this is a really good starting point for us to start developing the, the markets there, as well as filling existing needs from, from folks who you know, aren't happy about having to wait a year or two to get a, a clock product they really want. And then we're also working on future generations of this. So the ticker prime is really the, the main generation we're talking about for today. Um, but in the future, we're planning to also do a, a heavy duty version of the system. Um, so this is really designed to be extremely ruggedized to survive very, very broad environmental temperature mm -hmm. ranges, lots of thermal shock, um, vibe, all, all sorts of things um, that it's very, very resistant to. Um, and the, for concepts here, this is the this exact size of the physics package that is within this. So most of what's going to the HD is insulation, it's vibration isolation, it's things like that. The actual atomics package is you know, it's about 40 cubic centimeters, um, including insulation right now, and our, our laser package is similarly really small. So we think we can keep getting a lot smaller with this tech. It's part of why we picked the, the clock basis we did in Rubidium, because we can miniaturize it. We only need about you know, five millimeters of path length really to get this kind of performance. Whereas some other ways of using clocks may require, you know, many inches or even a foot of path length. Or sometimes you have to bounce your laser beam around a ton of times to get the signal you need. Mm -hmm. You really don't have to do that here, which makes it much more robust and measurable. So thank I'm super excited about, sorry. So yeah, no, so, so I think it's interesting because um, you're talking about going from here to here, you're making it smaller, but you're also planning to make it more rugged, which is pretty impressive that yeah. you can make it more robust, but in a smaller package. And while maintaining performance. That's awesome. So we, we started, we've had some great shock tests with some of the subsystems that go into the HD version. And there was one great day too, where we were just blowing like hammer blows going down on this system. And you, you couldn't even see the shock blows on the frequency data coming out of the device. That's awesome. Yeah. So awesome. it's a little bit further before that will be an official product. Um, but we were really excited to get that into the hands of the folks who want to do things like, you know, put it on a helicopter or a plane or anything like that. That's exciting. So, okay. So this is the near term ticker prime. This is sort of next gen, more rugged, smaller footprint, same performance. Yeah. What comes after that? What comes after that is what we're tentatively calling Ticker Blade right now, which is it's one of my largest research efforts that I've been pushing on here lately. And that's where we really go to full photonic integration. So we've already planned out you know, what exactly these circuits are going to look like. We're in uh, development testing to understand how to miniaturize them and combine them all into one monolithic substrate. Uh, at the end of the day, we think we can actually reach a physics package about akin to the size of an existing chip scale clock. So something about the size of you know, a Mac or a CSAC or something along those lines. Um, and we think we can get there without really sacrificing any of the performance, you know, maybe a little bit of drift, um, something like that. We'll, we'll see as we get closer, but this is something that we're expecting to have a product closer to 2030 or so. Um, That's really exciting. The idea that you could go from here down to this yeah. little bitty palm sized clock. That's awesome. And by doing this, you unlock a ton of new applications uh, mm -hmm. like this. This is not a unit you can necessarily put everywhere. Mm -hmm. This is a unit you can start attaching to basic, you know, driver boards, time cards, things like that to really have an integrated network that mm -hmm. has very easy access to reliable time. So we think that will be very important, especially in this form factor for things like uh, rollouts of 6G networks, autonomous vehicles, uh, autonomous drone delivery type systems, things like that. 
and just in areas where right now GPS or other geolocation services really struggle. So very dense cities, inside of buildings, inside of warehouses for logistics or transport, uh, where we think these clocks can really shine and allow you to have centimeter level type positioning uh, basically anywhere you can install them, um, which is why having a very tiny one becomes so impactful. That's awesome. So let's let's talk a little bit about sort of the nature of the clock itself and why we want like an optical atomic clock. Yeah, it has to do with um, the precision at which it can measure things, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the the rather crude analogy I like not not bad crude, uh, but just coarse is is think of a clock almost like a ruler with with having more ticks or less ticks on it. If you have mm -hmm. a, a ruler that's just a foot long. It's really hard to tell where you know 1.675 inches might be. Um, if you have lots of tick marks in there, you can start dividing up the distance into smaller and smaller chunks. And that's effectively what we do with our clocks. Our optical clocks tick really, really fast. They can divide mm -hmm. time up into much, much smaller pieces. In addition to doing that, they're also very accurate. So this clock will allow you to you know, pick a, a very specific optical frequency or mm -hmm. our radio frequency used in, in standard communications today. Um, and then also to really divide time up better. So we think mm -hmm. that the combination of better time division multiplexing and better channel density data networks, for instance, mm -hmm. um, might be a, a really interesting way to push forward with this technology. Gotcha. So how does... How does an optical clock help me with like data density and communications? Uh, there's there's a few different ways. So we are actively trying to work with a variety of different data and communications companies. That if you guys are on the webinar, please reach out. We'd love to talk with you more. Um, but the the two main routes we see are really in the time division multiplexing. So kind of how you chop up your data signal. And, and the shortest signal you can send kind of limits how many of those signals you can send in a fixed period of time. And our clock ticks so fast that you can start sending shorter and shorter signals. Mm -hmm. um, you can also have better timestamps on your data packets. So you can, mm -hmm. you can play some interesting tricks at kind of the server level of, of how you take in data, how you partition data, and how you mm -hmm. combine it. And then the other area is in the actual channel density itself in the fiber cables. So right now, they've at least to my knowledge, I'm, I'm a layman here, um, but if you really, really want high density communication, you go to optical. And when you do that, you have different frequencies you can send in this one cable. Mm -hmm. uh, the only limiter really of, of how many you can fit in there is how well you can resolve the different channels, how well you can resolve those different mm -hmm. frequencies. And clocks like this allow you to resolve optical frequencies ridiculously well, um, mm -hmm. in part because they have a, a unique tool inside of them called the frequency con. Um, and that allows you to both convert your optical signals down to usable electronic levels in the RF and microwave domain. Um, and it also allows you to have this nice kind of optical ruler. So you can take any bit of light, shine it with your cone, and kind of tell exactly what frequency it is. Gotcha. So, so in terms of that communications element, does this mean with that better density, you'll be able to, I don't know, have faster um, data transfer even when there's high network demand? Absolutely. So that, that's mm -hmm. one of the big areas here. There's also some really interesting novel communication schemes that are, are very good for encryption or security of the communications. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, you know, critical applications out there with with very, very little risk tolerance where mm -hmm. we think they could really improve their communication schemes with, with improved optical technologies. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'm really excited about the idea that uh, optical clocks will enable me to get my cat videos faster when I was like, the network is crowded. That's awesome. <laughs> Probably one of the best things to come out of. <laughs> so, so yeah, so let's, you, you mentioned sort of what goes into an optical atomic clock. Could you talk about briefly like, what the, what is the guts of an optical yeah. atomic clock? So the, the very core of all atomic clocks are the atoms, surprisingly enough. Um, and that's really cold quantas or inflections, bread and butter. Um, it's what cold quanta started doing back in the day. That's the area our company excels at, um, you know, clear out of the field of, of most everyone else out there. And that allows us to really trap and isolate these atoms so that they don't mm -hmm. see the environment around them as much. With a clock, at least that's what you want. You want your atoms mm -hmm. to not see your environment. You want them to be stable. So we have this atomics package. Uh, with our very, very isolated atoms. They are very lonely, which is a good thing in this case. Um, we take our laser beams, we shine them at the atoms. The atoms respond to the lasers in a way that tell us if our laser is at the right frequency or not. Um, most of the time, because the laser inherently moves around, they'll say, hey, can you move over three hertz? Um, they don't quite say it in English like that, but it's, it's about equivalent to that. Mm -hmm. um, and then that laser is, is interfaced with the optical frequency comb inside of the box. And that allows you to take the stability in the optical domain that we get from the atoms and mm -hmm. transmit it down to the radio frequency domain instead. So gotcha. that levels, you know, megahertz um, and, and gigahertz kind of levels that are typically used in electronics. Gotcha. So those, those are the main elements. And there's a control system, obviously, that interfaces with all of those things. Um, backup power supply so that you have some level of holdover if this becomes unplugged or there's a, a power glitch, something like that. Uh, we've really tried to make it as user-friendly as possible. Um, it's going to be, you know, cold start, turn on, you plug it in, you hit a button and 
you, you've got a system there that's ready within a few minutes to run. Gotcha. So, okay. So the, the components, essentially, we have our optical components, including a laser and a frequency comb. Yeah. We have our uh, physics package with our atoms in it. We have our electronics. And then I guess all of the um, the sort of the stabilization or buffer elements that, that help us to recognize it. Is that sort of what goes into it? Yeah, I think that's pretty good. <laughs> awesome. Pretty comprehensive summary. <laughs> awesome. So uh, I know that um, hydrogen masers and cesium beams are sort of standard time references on the market today. How does Ticker compare to those standard references? So the Ticker Prime product, we really tried to position where we think there is the most need in the market right now. Um, and, and most people you talk to are not, you know, hoping for better than Mesa performance. They're out there. I used to be one of them. Totally understand it. Um, but where we think we can make the biggest impact right now is somewhere between passive and active hydrogen masers. Um, and this performance really allows us, combined with some of the, the substantial holdover that the device can offer, to think that we can replace a lot of the existing cesium, um, some of the, the microwave rubidium, and then some of the laser technology that's out there. Especially these days with, you know, some of the wait times for maser systems being very long and passive maser inavailability, um, we think it's, it's really critical we get this product to market soon. Gotcha. And, and let's talk about sort of who would want to have a ticker and, and, and what they would use it for. Yeah. I mean, I think that the most crucial part to anybody wanting to use a ticker unit is, is not only making sure it's user friendly and you know, supplies the signals, but making sure it's also at a price point that is reasonable and that it's a reliable product. So mm -hmm. we are taking this through the full product lifecycle path. We are making sure this is a manufacturable product at scale, yeah. um, which inherently you know, improves a lot of the resiliency of the system. We know exactly how these will act. We'll have built you know, many, many hundreds of them soon. Um, and then we'll be able to really compare and provide very substantial data um, to really show exactly what performance you expect and make sure it's very reliable. Gotcha. Gotcha. So who, I guess, uh, can oh. we talk a little bit more about, yeah, the application, like who, who yes, wants to buy it and for what? Uh, so I think most of the people that are interested in this kind of clock are going to be existing customers of those masers and CCMs. They're going to be people who are doing database work, security, NTP, PTP, or White Rabbit based time servers, people in finance who need holdover or time tagging for their systems. High frequency traders might be particularly interested in, in the better performance you can get from this system for better mm -hmm. time tagging or timing resolution. Um, there's also a whole host of interesting, more you know, nerdy science applications. So um, similar clocks to this were what allowed you know very long baseline interferometry to work to allow us to image black holes. Um, very stable signals like this are the basis of many of the the LISA LIGO type gravitational wave observatories that are out there. So there's a whole gamut of users out there right now who would be interested in this from you know very very scientific academic folks who could still find this a very useful lab tool all the way through industry and large scale you know data networks finance um, places like that. Gotcha. So a lot of sort of scientific applications in terms of measurement, but then a fair number of of commercial applications, primarily Absolutely. in the sort of that that data and time stamping yeah. uh, arena initially. And, and that's where we're really wanting to push um, right now. So if anybody on this call is from those demographics and has interest in you know providing feedback on the product, what features you'd like to see as, as we roll out or have different uh, additional feature sets added um, in the future, things like that. So we are really making the right products to eventually reach scale. And that's that's really the focus of the company is making sure we're we're not just able to make one of these, but we can make hundreds of them and that we can scale down both the, the cost and the, the lead time on them while securing you know the quantum ecosystem as a whole. It's, gotcha. it's still something that needs nurturing to grow. Yeah. yeah. So what what are some of the benefits to being able to scale production up to higher volume? Uh, for a product like this, it's huge in part because uh, clocks don't have quirks and personalities of sorts. Um, if you've ever worked with like a Mazer bank or a Cesium bank or something like that, you probably have one or two of them that you just know are kind of quirky. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really easy to get data that might be misleading or, or make you think performance is better than it really is, or okay. sometimes worse than it really is. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we're trying to be very conservative with the specs we're putting out. There is a spec sheet available on the web seat, at website now. Uh, but we, we try to only put values on there. We feel we can really uh, provide at a mass scale manufacturing. So when we are producing these at the hundreds to thousands of them, mm -hmm. um, we, we want to make sure that we're putting out specs that will actually meet reliably. So mm -hmm. most of the clocks we've gotten so far actually perform well beyond specs. Uh, but that's that's what we're absolutely confident can come out of a larger scale production line. Gotcha. And is there a sort of cost benefit to scaling up? Absolutely. So that, that's one of the biggest things that we think is really important for the quantum ecosystem is making sure it actually gets into user hands. Mm -hmm. And that's not going to happen unless you reach reasonable price points. Um, so, you know, 
still not, not fully on the market, especially the reduced size ones. We're still working on where that will come. But all of them are being designed with manufacturing as a, a core design element. All of the mm -hmm. designs that go into this, we make sure can be assembled um, by you know relatively inexperienced technicians. We make sure that everything is as monolithic as possible. You know, the whole design ethos that went into this didn't start off as like let's make a cool clock. It started off, let's make a clock that can be productized. Let's gotcha. take something that can leave the lab that is robust and ruggedized. And, and that's really been the ethos from the beginning for these products. Gotcha. So so to kind of um like recap on one of your points. As we're able to manufacture more of them at higher volume, uh, we're going to be able to sort of drive down the individual price point and get it into more people's hands. Absolutely. Very cool. So what is the near-term sort of marketing plan for Ticker Prime? So Ticker Prime, uh, we really think it's going to be great for, for locations and data centers, for uh, terrestrial backup GPS networks, um, for some of the beyond GPS level timing that people are interested in, things where you can you know, have a sensor that you can tell the exact location of it to within a centimeter or maybe 10 centimeters, depending on the application or, or better than that even. Mm -hmm. um, it really depends on kind of what the user base is, is striving for these days. And that's part of why we wanted to have a webinar, talk to, to everyone out there and, and get a much better idea of what the, the potential customers are really looking for here to make sure we're designing the right products. And also to you know talk with them about new ways they could use these. Um, typically, clocks have been so expensive and inaccessible mm -hmm. that a lot of people don't even realize they could be part of a solution. And so now that we have something that's smaller and more affordable, we're really hoping that uh, we can work with people to get into hands that previously didn't even know was an option. Gotcha. So that, that kind of dovetails well with this idea of inflection as a, an ecosystem supporter and supplier, right? Absolutely. And, and that's, that's crucial for actually being a quantum systems company. And it's part of what led to us trying to really stick to a, a few species of atoms and a few types of modalities. So almost mm -hmm. all of our tech is based around this core vacuum cell technology. We try to use iridium everywhere we can. Um, occasionally we use other elements, cesium, things like that, or strontium. Uh, but, but really, the, the products, the things that are being productized are all based around that same core. So by building a really good clock, we're actually helping to build a really good QRF sensor. And we're actually helping to, you know, advance our quantum computing capabilities, things like that all at once. There's a lot of synergy this way. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, and, and I think that's something that I, you know, I'm, I'm biased working at Inflection, but I think that's something that's really cool about sort of the company ethos and portfolio is we have this breadth of different technologies, mm -hmm. but they're actually really only sort of superficially different. Yes. At the core of them, they, um, they're atoms uh, and lasers and manipulating atoms with lasers, yeah, right? Absolutely. Uh, one of my favorite analogy or stories, I guess, is mm -hmm. uh, at least back when I was more in academia, uh, I had friends that were on quantum computers. Uh, and a group of them accidentally made a really, really good clock. They didn't mean to, they were setting out to build a really good quantum computer, but because they're all based on the same technology, mm -hmm. uh, they're all, the core concept is having these really isolated atoms. Uh, you know, it, it happens you can accidentally do things like make a really, really good clock uh, while working within this field. The same thing happens with a lot of our sensors. There's mm -hmm. more overlap than most people realize. And sometimes the difference between a really good clock and a really good magnetic field sensor is is the shielding you put around it and exactly how you poke it with your laser beam. Uh, but the, the core hardware doesn't necessarily have to change. That's really fantastic. So we're talking about, uh, you know, this, this ticker product line and, and marketing ticker. Uh, are you, are, are, are we planning to sell it globally or just the United States? Tell us about the sort of global yeah, marketing plan. Absolutely. So we, we've already started porting some of the production for a ticker product line over to our UK office in Oxford. Um, this was a big push um, funded in part by Innovate UK funding. We've got an excellent team over there of, of clock specialists as well. Um, and we we did this porting process now before there are any type of shipment restrictions. Right now, this clock qualifies as EAR99, so we can ship it globally without restriction. Um, but we do expect as we improve upon it and we make it more ruggedized and smaller, that restrictions are going to kick in. So this way, we kind of have seed programs starting in a variety of countries um, mm -hmm. that can work with each other as much as restrictions allow. But it means at the end of the day, when we start making something that is more of this size, we can sell it anywhere because we'll be producing it in a variety of countries. That's awesome. So yeah, I think earlier you, you were talking about the different locations that we have globally. Where all are we planning to sort of have those seed programs eventually? So the, the biggest right now is the UK. We've got mm -hmm. a substantial amount of funding there from both government and other sources um, that are really letting us push on that technology. So they've been looped in. They work closely with our U.S. team now. Um, we're also looking to stand up full-scale manufacturing very soon. So we're looking at some options in, in Texas and other places in the United States. Um, and I've started, you know, considering exactly how we want to go about this process. Um, 
And to that end, I also have a really nice picture of some of what we think the, the ticker product might look like. Point it out the computer, maybe. If my screen was working. <laughs> There we go. Ooh, it's sexy. So it's going to save this for the, the very end, but uh, so we're talking about it right now. Um, mm -hmm. We are looking at exactly what this product is going to look like when it's in full production mode. Mm -hmm. um, and here's some of the concepts we've drawn up, trying to make it really functional, easy to use, make sure it's portable, easy to you know install on a rack, has candles mm -hmm. in reasonable locations, um, doesn't get dusty when left alone in a closet and ignored for three years so that <laughs> not needing to be interrupted, things along those lines to, to really try to make sure that this is a uh, you know, an impactful product that comes to market that people want to use, but mm -hmm. it's effective and simple and easy to use. Gotcha. And returning to something that you talked about earlier, clock ensembles. Yeah. Uh, can you, what is a, a clock ensemble? So clocks are often used in ensembles. It's, it's pretty rare that any sort of critical or risk adverse application would ever trust one clock mm -hmm. uh, because things can go wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. Even if the, the possibility of something going wrong is very, very small, if you have a critical application where you, you need this information, you know, if you lose a data packet, you lose some social security information or, or put something public or, or lose an important classified data file, something like that. Um, there, there's a lot of reasons where you want to make sure you have multiple clocks mm -hmm. so these things don't happen. And a lot of that happens just by having diversity in the ensemble. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the, the DHS recommendations for, for secure time systems uh, really hone in on the idea of having a resilient ensemble through diversification. Okay. So if you have you know, a, a ticker type clock in your ensemble, it's a very different clock than most microwave clocks out there. It has different mm -hmm. sensitivities, it has different environmental responses, mm -hmm. um, and it uses a very different system of, of fields. So if you have you know, a lot of RF pickup at a certain frequency, it might disturb a microwave clock, um, but it might not disturb the optical clock in the same way or as much. So by mm -hmm. having both of those clocks in your ensemble, where you're looking at mm -hmm. the timing from both, from, from multiple sources like that, you can ultimately have a much more resilient ensemble that is less prone to having errors and that can survive a broader range of conditions you might throw at it. Gotcha. So you want, you want a clock ensemble when you want to make sure that you have backups to ensure that you're getting accurate information. Yeah. But then you also want different types of clocks in that ensemble. That's as much diversification. Yeah. Uh, so, so someone who is interested in uh, a microwave clock might also additionally be interested in an optical clock yeah. or a variety of different types. Oh, yeah. And, and one of the big things compared to most microwave clocks out there, see, the, the hydrogen emissors really, um, is that this clock is, is much better performance than nearly all kind of beam type clocks, many of the rubidium microwave clocks in the market right now. Um, and part of that is just by going to optical domain. We, we kind of get to cheat a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. The figure of merit is really the fractional frequency instability, not just the frequency instability. So you care about what the nominal frequency is. And by going from tens of gigahertz, where most microwave clocks are, up to hundreds of terahertz, you kind of get a free factor of 10,000 in performance which allows us then to, to have a clock that can have all this extra space for other things to ruggedize it because we're not fighting for every little bit of performance anymore. We've got a lot of overhead. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, let's let's talk a little bit more about the applications end of thing. You know, as we were sort of preparing for this webinar, we talked about how you can send clocks into space. Yes. I, I wore my, <laughs> my space themed socks today on purpose. Uh, why, why would we want to put clocks in space? So there are already tons of clocks in space. Uh, ah, that was okay. actually one of the first big applications of atomic clocks was to establish uh, global navigation satellite systems. So GNSS, um, GPS, Live, um, Beidou, all, all sorts of different constellations are out there these days. And all of them share one thing in common, just having a really, really nice atomic clock at, at the heart of the satellite. Mm, okay. Uh, there's also other interesting applications in space for use of clocks, uh, deep space navigation. Many of these are, are further off and, and more academically based, but I still think are really cool. Um, but the, the core of a lot of these clocks and where we want to go and why we want to ruggedize them is to eventually get a space qualified version that could go on future mm. GPS satellites. Um, in addition to GPS, there's also other satellite constellations going up to provide supplemental GPS or GNSS type services um, or just improved optical communications in between satellites. There's some really interesting encryption protocols you can implement using optical communications between satellites, and that, mm -hmm. that tends to be the, the preferred method up there. Um, so we, we think there's a lot of utility if there was a space qualified version of this clock. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, so bringing things sort of from space back a little closer to home, we talked earlier about how uh, cl uh, atomic clocks will help us have sort of better communications and data signal. I can get my cat videos faster. Uh, what are some sort of um, a little bit further down the road potential applications? I think you mentioned the idea that you might put um, uh, an atomic clock in a stoplight. Why would we want to do that? How, what, what does that yeah. open up? 
So once once we have these these smaller clocks, we really think they're going to wind up showing up everywhere in, in large mm -hmm. part because of how useful they are. So if you had these types of clocks at every stoplight in a major city, for instance, you could have a local timing network that could be used for you know both data syncs so you can get your cat videos, um, but also for things like uh, precise navigation. You could have algorithms that could adjust the stoplights in response to the amount of traffic coming through. Mm -hmm. uh, you could really closely monitor exactly where people are located for first responder type scenarios based on mm -hmm. their cell phone locations from just having these really, really good clocks close by. Uh, a lot of the noise that gets added to timing signals is actually in the transmission. So a lot of the GPS signals you get, they're actually limited by you know, atmospheric fluctuations, things like that. You have to use a ground segment to supplement that information. Mm -hmm. um, it'd be a very similar thing that you do with these clocks. It's having kind of a ground-based local network to supplement all existing position navigation and timing information. Um, it, we think that'll be core to getting things like the level five autonomy that's going to be needed for autonomous vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, and then for some of the 6G applications out there, the sync requirements to really transmit data fast enough that look like they might really want to be going in the direction of having a clock like this as opposed to existing chip scale clocks out there. Gotcha. Can you help me understand what level five autonomy means and how the clock plays into that? Yeah, so it's, it's a very specific term. Um, it, it really just refers to kind of the amount of communication that is needed between any two nodes in the network. So you mm -hmm. need to know within, a, you know, exactly what location you are within a certain number of centimeters, uh, things like that. And there's, you know, I'm not the right person to talk about it. Really. There's a long list of, of the requirements that really tie into this. Um, and it's, it's still in the building phase. A lot of these um, are living documents of a sort as we're really understanding what this autonomy level will entail. Uh, but we think it'll it'll be really crucial to have good timing for, for data communications and then for also positioning information. Gotcha. So so the this idea that we have this sort of um, smaller footprint, high precision clock, we can have uh, not just better data communications, but these local networks that will enable yeah. sort of better communication on the ground, potentially eliminating the need for, in some instances, for access to GPS. I think you'll always want GPS. GPS okay. is great. It's free. Uh, no one's, no one's going to argue <laughs> with free. And it's it also has traceability back to UTC. So there's a lot of benefits from having that external system. Mm -hmm. There's also a huge host of benefits from having a local system. Um, gotcha. So it's not even just data. It's, it's also critical infrastructure, electric <laughs> rates, all, all of the ways we do right now transmit information and and energy basically are, are turning more into mesh tight networks they're no longer a big central node that disseminates everything out there's kind of these different pockets of groups now that are either producing energy or producing data or doing computations that then need to be combined mm -hmm. and so that's putting a lot more restrictions on the, the timing needs for that data how you send that data when you send that data how you recombine that data how you partition that data in the first place mm -hmm. is all really really dependent upon the timing signals you have the better time you have, the more precisely you can carry out those operations, the more dense your data communication can be, the better you can interface these different segments of a mesh network. Gotcha. So this, like having those sort of local signal is not just going to have sort of a, a direct impact on, on me surfing the internet, but also sort of an indirect impact of you could integrate clocks into your, your energy grid and then I get fewer like blackouts or downtime if there's sort of issues Absolutely. with usage. Especially if they're looking towards the more advanced energy grids. Most grids these days don't need you know precision timing like you might get from a ticker. Mm -hmm. uh, but what they're trying to do with the mesh networks looks like they they might need the improved performance there. Um, there's also a, a lot of other types of applications that are based on these mesh grids. So the, the entire internet of things is, is this kind of way. Um, so anytime you might be wanting to use your cell phone, but also be able to walk between rooms or driving mm -hmm. in your car, uh, you need really, really good timing to switch between these different local networks. Most of the time you don't notice. Timing is one of those things where like when it's working, you're happy. You don't even know it's happening. Um, but when it goes wrong, it can go horribly wrong. The, the mm -hmm. economic impact of losing GPS for a day is, is estimated at like a billion dollars or something like that per day. Um, so it's it, it ends up being a huge impactive factor to, to life, the economy. Um, mm -hmm. Most people are just blissfully unaware of it. Gotcha. So so the, the clock can sort of be a stand-in for certain functionalities if we lose access to GPS? Absolutely. GPS holdover is, is one of the you know most accessible, easy to implement systems. I mean, in that case, you'd have a, a ticker clock. You could synchronize it to GPS initially or to UTC through some other method. Um, and then you can use this in a holdover scenario. So if GPS goes out, um, mm -hmm. you can then say, hey, I want to use this as my timing signal instead. Switch mm -hmm. over to it. How you do the switch? Um, and, and how you would know when it's time to do the switch are, are more complicated questions. And, mm -hmm. and we're developing some tech and IP in those areas as well. Um, and trying to work with other companies to, to, to understand really what those interruptions look like for them. Gotcha. So you, you so some 
ridiculously large number of, of economic impact if you lose access to GPS. Yeah. What was that again? Uh, I, I think it's a, I, I can't remember the article. I don't want to say there are people online like, who could totally correct me right now. Yeah. Um, but it, I think it was upwards of a billion dollars a day. Wow. So why, why, why are we so dependent on GPS? Like, where does that loss come from? Like, a lot of it is that it, it's free and easy. GPS is there, mm -hmm. just kind of in the air around you. Um, mm -hmm. Most people don't realize how easily compromised GPS can be. Okay. So there's been a huge rise in the, in the you know, every year you hear more and more news stories that, that kind of, as, as the GPS use increases and it ends up showing up in, in every, you know, non-crucial application, mm -hmm. there are lots of easier ways to kind of break into systems and get people's data through yeah. spoofing, jamming, or other things. Um, so it's just, it's a lot less secure. Um, mm -hmm. If you have a local timing source, you can always at least say like, I agree with GPS or I don't. And you can gain mm -hmm. a lot of information from that. Gotcha. So, so what, what potential example would be like, if you don't have access to GPS, you don't have access to your time stamping, And then for like, I don't know, um, like toast tab or whatever to make a payment, does that become inaccessible? Didn't something like that happen recently where oh, someone, maybe. some, some provider of, of, of payment services, they make a little square or mm -hmm. whatever, went down and then people people couldn't pay their employees and and do their payroll or make exchanges so I, i'm not familiar with that particular story but that doesn't surprise me at all yeah so okay so it's interesting how that sort of economic impact of gps is i guess okay. i guess we're very dependent on gps in a way yeah. most people don't every realize. time you have a financial transaction you're actually using gps every time you take money out of an atm it mm -hmm. is referenced back to gps in some way or, or utc really um, for financial transactions and part of that is the government regulations, <laughs> and part of that is just to ensure that the, you know the database um, continuity, that the the information that you're collecting is is relevant and factual. Gotcha. So so having uh, a local time source as a backup for if there's any issues with GPS mm -hmm. does have this really sort of outsized economic impact. Yeah. And we also think there are some really interesting ways we could combine our clocks and our radio frequency sensors to allow you to not only say like, yeah, we don't trust GPS right now, but we don't trust GPS because of a signal coming from right there. Mm -hmm. And so there's some really cool things you can start doing to, to not just give you information about, you know, GPS bad right now, um, mm -hmm. but hey, this is how we fix it. These are where people are that are, are you know, being bad actors and, and doing things mm -hmm. to compromise these systems, which is really, really useful for both, you know, making sure these disruptions are short lived. Mm -hmm. You need to locate the source. It can be very difficult if you've just got some dude with a, you know, a trucker with a GPS jammer over by an airport. It can take a while to find him in the meantime. Many flights will be canceled and it will make local news networks and, and national news networks, things like gotcha. that. Um, so we think there's some really cool things we can do later to both improve the GPS. And, you know, as, as GPS spoof jamming becomes harder to detect, as people detect it better, mm -hmm. it's kind of this cat and mouse game perpetually. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, the only thing you can really do to make sure you can monitor GPS is to be much, much better than it. So you have a, a trusted source locally that mm -hmm. you can say, you know, we're doing GPS to sync, to communicate, to, you know, globally interact. But mm -hmm. locally, we trust our own network more. And that's going to happen mm -hmm. when you start having a diverse clock ensemble locally with much mm -hmm. better timing. And, and that's kind of where we see uh, Ticker being really, really helpful for a lot of terrestrial-based backup geolocation networks. Gotcha. And I, I remember that story about the... Uh, the the, the airport and yeah. the, the GPS blocker. Uh, and I, I think that's another great illustration of the potential economic impact of not having a local timing source when you lose access to GPS. Because yeah. I can imagine how much the airlines lost uh, yes. on all those canceled flights as a result. And of course, the interruption to everyone's schedule and all of that. Airlines, so clock could have prevented that potentially. Absolutely. And, and airlines have a lot of other systems based on clocks as well. There's ASB and, and WAS and all sorts of uh, local timing networks that are used mm -hmm. to ensure your planes can land regardless of visibility uh, or access to GPS signals. So there's there's a lot we think in commercial airlines also that, that would help you know meet regulations and things like that by having a, a onboard clock um, to really make sure that <laughs> they're safely land. I mean it's it's aviation that actually started GPS being you know civilly inaccessible in the first place. There was an horrible mm -hmm. accident that could have been avoided if they had access to GPS. And now we've kind of reached a point where GPS is accessible to everyone, but not always trustworthy. So mm -hmm. similar accidents could happen without, uh, you know, local GPS networks or GNSS type networks to supplement data. Gotcha. So well, let's, we've been talking sort of like more broadly about clocks and their various applications. Let's come back to Ticker Prime. Mm -hmm. Uh, what can we share about sort of our, our early customers, who they are or who we envision them being? So I, I think the most, we envision our customers, you know, being pretty broad right now, we've tried to build a product that sits in the middle of the road. 
-hmm. and it's very attractive to a diverse group of customers. Mm -hmm. That's part of why we have a pilot program going right now. So if you want to get your hands on these, we have please please reach out. We have a, an easy link on the website. There will also be a survey sent out after that mentions it. Um, but we have a pilot program now to get one of these in your hands. So we can start getting voice of customer feedback right away from users. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll we'll have quite a few of those units actually in the pilot program that will be in full swing next year. We've already started it this year and it has mm -hmm. some initial sales of the units though. Gotcha. And what kinds of applications do we envision our sort of early customers using in the ticker for? I think a lot of it is the data communications folks, mm -hmm. people who are doing optical data center and optical based switching and their data networks. Um, you know, a lot of them are things we've already kind of touched on at least a little bit at, at this uh, webinar mm -hmm. so far. But I think there's also a lot of applications we're just unaware of, especially many of us coming from academia. Um, so if anybody is out there who wants to use a clock or has a, a novel idea of how they might incorporate into their technology uh, or service, please let us know. Because the more we talk to people, the more applications seem to come up with. Uh, most people just didn't realize this was a solution or an option. Um, gotcha. And now that it kind of is, it's, it's another knob to turn to optimize your business. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I think we've reached a point where we could start doing some questions. Sure. So, um, one participant asked, how do you view U.S. and global government funding for commercialization efforts? How are you working with the U.S. and other governments? And can you characterize that a bit more? So we could break that into the first and to a few questions. How do you view U.S. and global government funding for commercialization efforts? Awesome. That's a great question. Thank you, Brittany. Um, Actually, you are our, our director of, <laughs> do, do you want to take that? <laughs> I can go to more clock specific direction. Um, uh, yes, actually, I realized I forgot to introduce myself at the top of the hour. Yeah. Christina Willis, I'm our uh, director of external and government affairs. Uh, and I guess the question was U.S. government funding mm -hmm. for manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Was there an international component to the question or? Yes. How do you view U.S. and global government funding for commercialization efforts? So I think this comes to the topic of the Valley of Death, where at least in the United States, of course, my knowledge is very U.S. specific, um, but there, the U.S. government is really excellent at uh, funding uh, R&D, developing really cool cutting edge technologies, new discoveries. Uh, and then uh, if you look at the other end of the spectrum, venture capital is really great at helping take a product and scale it up and get it to volume manufacturing. Where there's a gap, what we call the valley of death, is that sort of between government and venture capital, going from laboratory and getting it to a robust prototype phase, something that is ready to be scaled to high volume, uh, there's a gap in funding, right? Um, that sort of getting from laboratory to prototype is a little too long-term for most, most VCs to want to fund. Uh, and then government doesn't have a lot of, of funding for that arena. And so something that is sort of I, in, in my work, uh, um, working with, with Congress and as Inflection in general, we're really promoting this idea of uh, how do we get um, better programs and sort of government funding to address that valley of death. Uh, how do we get better sort of public-private partnerships in order to, to cover that area? Because there's so many really promising startups with really cool technology. 90% uh, of them fail. And we don't want to see that in quantum technology. We want to see as much quantum technology pushed to market as we can, which is sort of what we are, we are actively doing ourselves. But as an ecosystem supplier, we're trying to support other uh, quantum companies and research and sort of help them achieve that goal as well. So. We all kind of win together. Things. Exactly. Exactly. You, you can't. I mean, we put our atoms in a vacuum, but you can't develop this quantum technology in a yeah, exactly. Kind of full vacuum. Exactly. So, like you know, we're not we're not a manufacturer of optical frequency combs, right? So we have we have suppliers ourselves uh, that we want to see succeed with us in sort of bringing these products to market. Yeah. So I, I would also say that there's been a. A, a shift, at least in the option opportunities for funding that I've seen come out of government, um, particularly in the U.S. last few years, and, and a focus on clocks. This seems to be a, a technology that is is very much you know desired by our government right now for use. 
Um, and historically, that has also been the main driver that has helped things reach commercialization. So the original, you know, the CSAC program is, is brought up a lot as kind of a defining moment um, in terms of clock history that would have never made it to product really without significant government support and investment. Um, so we're seeing that tick up as well. And, mm -hmm. and the awareness that it's important not just to develop one or two of these systems, we want to be making, you know, tens and hundreds and thousands of these systems. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way you're going to really have a reliable source mm -hmm. of you know, really, really good atomic clocks. You're never gonna have a business that stays in business selling three or four of these a year. You really need to be at scale for this to be impactful and for the, the business to be successful so you have access to it mm -hmm. the time. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. I'm actually gonna let Matt Sanchez ask his questions about CSAC, so. I'll try my best. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, do you wanna ask your question? Then I can ask. Um, so he asks, are you working with other CSAC manufacturers to learn from their processes or lessons learned? We we absolutely try to gain information anywhere we can. Um, I don't believe we have any sort of like formal uh, partnership set up with any existing of the, the CSAC manufacturers or any of the component manufacturers. It's definitely something we're interested in, especially as we're expanding our vapor cell manufacturing. That's um, one of the, the biggest pushes we've really undergone in the last year or two is shifting the focus back to developing these precision glass cells and making them smaller and more robust um, and really developing all of the infrastructure needed to characterize them properly, make sure we understand you know, everything about their long-term aging, you know, all, all these little facets that can be very tricky when it comes to actually using them on a clock. So that's something I think we're definitely open to. I'm not really the right person to be speaking about that though. Um, so you know, if you have more questions or, or know anybody who'd be interested in working with us, please, please reach out. That'd be amazing. Thank you. Okay, another question. What is the useful life of the ticker compared to traditional cesium? Right now, we think it's right comparable. Um, the, the amount of rubidium that's in here, the atomics package is not expected to be a limitation of the system long-term. Uh, we really expect maybe one of the laser components to go first. And then we've really tried to make sure that the way we've integrated laser components into the chassis are user-friendly for replacement um, so that you know you don't need to really know what you're doing to, to undo three screws, pull out a unit, pop a new one in. And then there's automation routines that can automatically you know go through and recalibrate all of your servo coefficients that can retune your laser to make sure it's, it's actually hitting your atomic resonance uh, without, you know, needing a, a small group of PhD physicists there <laughs> who understand the spectroscopy to, to give you feedback. So we, we try to take that into account. We really think uh, an MTBF of 10 years is, is a reasonable target. Uh, we're not going to, you know, we're, we're going through testing to really substantiate that. It takes a long time to qualify a clock, especially when you're talking about the long-term holdover performance for these types of systems. So again, what we try to put on the spec sheet, I think we have 10 years MTBF, maybe it's Maybe it's five. Maybe I shouldn't be speculating on a live <laughs> webinar. Um, but uh, whatever number we have on there is, is something that we feel very, very secure in when we go to production for, and we have plans mm -hmm. to improve it, really test it, and, and make sure we fully understand everything that goes into impacting the lifetime of the devices. And well, and I think this is a really good point coming back to this idea that we weren't just focused on making clocks, we're focused on making clocks that are designed for manufacturability. Yes. Right? That modularity element you're talking about. Absolutely. And, and that's not an easy thing to, to retro design in. If we hadn't started most of these clock projects with that in mind, it would have been very difficult to make that transition. Um, all the systems are so interconnected. It's really easy to, yeah. you know, think of them as a whole unit instead of individual modules that need to be useful both here and elsewhere. Gotcha. Okay, the next one this is a good one. What is the single most mind blowing factoid about how ticker works or what it does? Oh, <laughs> no, no pressure. <laughs> um, I don't know if any of it, I'm not at the mind blowing part since I've, I've been oh, in this field for so long that it's, I think it's hard for me to know like what is new and novel. One thing that I think is really cool, maybe not mind blowing to the average AMO physicist. But uh, we have a frequency doubler in here. And I always thought frequency doubling was really cool. Um, so this is where you can take you know, light at a given wavelength. So maybe something in infrared that you can barely see that's kind of reddish in color. Um, mm -hmm. And you can frequency double it to have the wavelength. And so you can start off with a laser. In our case, we start off with a telecom C-band laser at 1556 mm -hmm. nanometers. And you send it through this, this crystal um, <laughs> that is able to double that, that frequency. And so mm -hmm. what comes out of the crystal at the end of it is actually light, in our case, at 778 nanometers. So I, I always thought that was really cool. People talk about like healing power of crystals and stuff. Uh, for me, <laughs> I'm really a fan of, of what they can do to laser light. Yeah, yeah. Nonlinear optics is definitely super cool. I, I would yeah. say for myself, just like, you know, coming, I come from a laser background, not an AMO or a clocks background. 
the idea that um, the clock is so much more precise than 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 anything else that exists. Like That's we talked about that ticks in our, <laughs> the, the ticks in a ruler, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so how many times, like if we talk about like how many times a clock ticks in a second? How many times does ticker tick in a second? So ticker ticks at a rate of, uh, what is it, 485 terahertz? Terahertz, okay. So we're talking hundreds of terahertz. So okay. it, it's, there's a lot of zeros there. What is what is the uh, the ten to the minus for terahertz? Uh, for terahertz, it's ten to the twelve. So ten to the twelve. So we're talking about so another hundred is like ten to the minus fourteen. 14 so, so ten to the fourteen ticks per second is a lot. Yeah, that's um, that's wild. Like one how many divisions of a perception. second that is? The, the level of precision. And I think I think the numbers are like it takes like a microsecond or so for like sensation to get from like touching your fingertip to your brain to realize it's even been touched. These clocks are doing things on scales humans can't even perceive. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely wild. Uh, yeah, yeah. So. that was a much better answer. Can I <laughs> well, <change? laughs> well, I have like you've been working with clocks forever, so I have the uh, the sort of yeah. exterior view uh, of the clock, as it were. Uh, excellent question. Yes, we have great questions. Um, okay, a few more going back to governments on mm -hmm. um, some funding. A user asked, there are suggestions that governments are moving forward with legislation, you, Christina, mm -hmm. <laughs> that mandates timing resiliency for government networks. Mm -hmm. Will you be selling to these foreign governments in addition to the U.S. government? We're definitely open to selling to any of the you know, United States or its allied countries out there, the Five Eyes kind of network stuff for sure. Um, the rest of it is definitely a question above my pay grade. Um, I, I think we definitely plan to sell it in a very legal manner. Um, mm -hmm. And we'd be very glad to help out United States allies. Most countries these days seem really focused on developing their internal supply chain. So that's what mm -hmm. we've tried to hone in on, at least for the first few embodiments of this. That's why we have the United States and the UK um, ticker efforts to kind of you know, serve the US and the EU markets um, mm -hmm. more substantially. Uh, does that answer the question? What was yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, yeah, we definitely sort of have a, have a, a US ally and, and AUKUS focus in terms of um, our, our business model. Um, okay, the next question. Are there components that need to be replaced or maintained? Right now, the average user will not need to do anything in this uh, system. Uh, they self-calibrate their auto-tuning of all of the you know, servo PID coefficient type systems in there. So this is really a plug-and-play device, ultimately. Um, the thing that might be replaced are some of the laser systems uh, potentially might not quite hit the lifetime limits that we're really targeting here, at least in the, the earlier generations as we're you know, firming up the supply chain. For the system, uh, again, we've made those really easy to replace. So it's, it's pretty modular um, and, and at a level where we think you can do on-site repairs without necessarily needing to have someone fly up there, which allows you to fix things faster. Um, it also speaks to the fact that we'll have these items in stock in our supply chain. This isn't going to be a replacement where you, know, you have to take some critical component out, send it off to a factory, wait six months to get something back. Um, this is really designed to be fixable on the fly, which we've gotten to demonstrate a few times uh, <laughs> during some of our much earlier demos, which was really fun. Thank you. Okay, we have a few more questions. Um, so in slightly more detail, how do the atoms tell you that the laser is hitting them at the right frequency? Okay. Ooh, one more question, <laughs> follow up question with that. Mm -hmm. How do you adjust the laser frequency when it drifts out of lock? Awesome, two great questions. Okay, so uh, the atoms usually, it's not how you have to do things, but we use the, the atomic fluorescence as a gauge of how strongly they're responding. So atoms have a resonance. Um, and when you get your frequency of your laser right at that resonance, they respond super strongly. They'll start emitting lots of photons or changing states. They start, you know, responding in some way. If your laser light is not near that frequency, they, they usually just kind of sit there. Mm -hmm. And so you're able to take the strength of their response by collecting the light that the atoms emit and use that to tell you how close you are. So in the case of our clock, we're using a very standard uh, modulation scheme. Um, and it allows us to say, you know, hey, atoms, we're poking you right now at this frequency. And the atoms might say, yay. And then we change the laser frequency and we poke it slightly higher. Now, atoms, how do you like this? And they, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, maybe that was a terrible way of putting it. Um, no, that's a great element. But basically that how strongly they respond to mm -hmm. our, our laser pokes lets us know if the laser needs to be moved. And then you can do special things with the way you modulate so that you know for sure if the frequency needs to be higher or lower based mm -hmm. on the way the atoms respond. 
And how are we changing the laser frequency? In this, uh, in this case, we feed back to the laser current. So we're, we're doing a direct current modulation. It lets us save a lot of the equipment and hardware that might otherwise be used. It also mm -hmm. allows us to have a smaller power budget for implementing this type of system. We don't need a lot of external modulators. There's no AOMs, there's no EOMs, mm -hmm. things like that, that, that might show up in a lot of other optical systems. Does, but does tuning the current that you're sending to laser tune the power coming out of the laser as well? It does. Okay. So we have intensity servos. Uh, there's there's a lot of different mm -hmm. servos monitoring okay. that goes on inside this box. We're constantly monitoring um, what the laser frequency is using the atoms, also using some larger scale you know, spectroscopy tricks as needed. Uh, we're constantly tuning the laser intensity, uh, mm -hmm. monitoring for, you know, our is the laser acting exactly as we expect it to? Or do we think the laser is maybe getting unhappy? Maybe we need a, a light to go on in the front to indicate that within the next two years, we think your laser system might start having issues mm -hmm. for zero repair cycles, things like mm -hmm. that. Um, so, so generally we try to monitor every so, aspect. Okay, so so it's the, the, the current is used to tune the frequency of the laser, but mm -hmm. we have another component that can maintain a particular output power yes. so you're not sort of influencing your data that way. Yeah. And you're monitoring the fluorescence of the atom as you tune the current slash the frequency of the laser. Yeah. And then I guess we have some sort of electronic feedback loop for looking when the, yeah. when the fluorescence from the atoms is the brightest. Yeah. There, cool. There's also a, a, another loop there that does temperature tuning of the laser. Okay. Um, so as lasers are prone to having mode hops, maybe this mm -hmm. is too technical for this audience, um, but you need to tune the laser temperature as well. So you make sure that you have a really wide region over which your laser behaves happily. We might mm -hmm. only be moving the laser around a little tiny bit, but mm -hmm. having those unhappy spots further away from your actual gotcha. resonance you care about can still contaminate what the atoms see. That makes sense. Awesome. Do we have time for maybe one more question? Yes. Before? We're going to have one more question. And then there's a few questions just about where to find the spec. So oh, okay. maybe cool. we could close the conversation sure. of where we find resources. That sounds good. Okay. The final question is your comments on your products being interlocking were interesting. Can you say a little more about how all inflections products fit together mm -hmm. and the data that you think you'll get from them? Oh, wow. That's, that's a good question. So mm -hmm. a lot of these products especially since they're based on very similar technology, there are ways we could perceive combining them using a single set of hardware, for instance. Um, mostly these are you know, longer term developments, but especially combining the power of RF receivers and transmitters with our clocks could effectively give you a, a mobile you know, GPS type system um, that you can bring anywhere and have beyond GPS level timing. The, the RF sensors can also be made very, very resilient to spoof jam. They, they have very low side lobe characteristics. I'm not using all the right words, mm -hmm. um, but, but things like that we think could be really, really powerful. If you combine, you know, the timing system with a really, really good inertial sensor, like our add-on interferometers that we're working on, um, that can give you basically autonomous navigation if you combine them right. Mm -hmm. um, we also think there's a lot going on with sensor fusion with classical sensors. So while we think we, you know, we can totally combine a lot of these quantum systems to get interesting performance, we think there's a lot of utility in just using regular out there already sensors. So if you combine, for instance, one of our you know, atomic inertial interferometers with a classical IMU or something like that, you could have a really, really wide dynamic range that can allow you to detect accelerations that are extremely slow and small or big and fast. And you combine that with really good timing information, and now you can tell exactly where you've gone and when, and mm -hmm. you can effectively navigate without, without needing a, a map or you know exactly how far you've gone. Yeah. Yeah, well, and I think that comes back to this like idea of vehicle autonomy and being able to operate without yeah. access to GPS or in the event of a GPS yeah. interruption. Um, I'll also um, kind of point out in terms of this ecosystem view that inflection has, we have work in all kinds of quantum sensing, clocks and loading oh, yeah. them. We have some quantum networking projects mm -hmm. and we have quantum compute projects. And so uh, our sort of vision for the future is that you will have quantum networks connected to quantum sensors, connected to quantum computers. Yeah. And then you really uh, unlock all the, all the individual powers, but sort of combining them together in that sort of synergy where you can convey the quantum sensing information along a quantum network to your quantum computer. Yeah. Uh, and that, that will really sort of go, go to the next level in terms of our how quantum will affect the future and how we do business and live. I, I think I'm really yes. looking forward to the day when we have to stop saying, we're, we don't have to say quantum. In front yeah, of <laughs> it's um, just a computer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, this is, this, none of this is magic. This is just mm -hmm. building better sensors using, you know, physics that we've discovered this century and mm -hmm. for, you know, the last few decades really in a lot of the yeah. cases. It, it's just the, the next, next step of natural progression of where we're, all these things are going. So 
you know, well, they are quantum. I, I'm hoping that, you know, 20 years from now, there's no real difference between just a system and a quantum system because they're so ubiquitous. And, and that's the route we're really pushing on and I think we can get to. Awesome. Yeah. Well, we're sort of come towards the end of the hour. So any, any final closing thoughts or words for our audience? Uh, yeah, I do just want to, again, say we're sending out a survey after this. We would really, really appreciate feedback, any sort of specs or, or feature sets you guys are interested in these clocks, or if you're interested in talking to us more to learn how you potentially incorporate them into your own businesses or data centers, things like that. And then our, our pilot program is also really starting to take off. So we are looking for these early users that are looking to get uh, pre-production type units into their hands, um, start actually using them, give us feedback on them um, as we are scaling up manufacturing. Awesome. So yeah, we definitely want to hear from you. We're super excited that you came to join us today for this webinar. Webinar. We hope you enjoyed it. We would love your feedback uh, on the webinar itself, on potential applications you can think of for ticker, anything of that nature. Please make sure to respond to the survey and have a wonderful rest of your day. Yep. Thank you.